Hello and welcome to Iowa Ed Chat Live. We continue to bring you the latest educational news each month, and we are pleased to be able to connect with you tonight. We have a very special guest joining us. Jennifer Gonzalez is here to chat, and we will introduce her in just a few minutes. In the meantime, you can connect with Jennifer on, at, on Twitter at Cult of Pedagogy. As you can see, tonight's chat will have a live video stream and we will be taking questions from the audience. Please submit your questions for Jennifer via our hashtag on Twitter. That's hashtag IAEdChat. We will monitor this feed, so please don't hesitate to share your thoughts. We will get this show on our podcast later tonight. If you have not checked us out on iTunes or on Podomatic, do that. Please subscribe to us, give us a rating. We really appreciate your feedback and your engagement. Well, we're gonna get this party started with a couple of introductions. I will start. My name is Dan Butler. I am an elementary principal at Epworth Elementary School. That is part of the Western Dubuque School District. And I'm gonna kick it to my partner in crime, Andrea Townsley. Hey everybody. My name is Andrea Townsley. I am a former fourth grade teacher turned instructional coach, and now I am a school improvement consultant at the local AEA at Grantwood AEA, and I'm super excited to welcome our guest here tonight. I'm going to give you a short read from the bio, and then we will go ahead and get started. So welcome, Jennifer. Jennifer is a former middle school language arts teacher. She spent seven years in education. Half of that time was spent in the greater DC area and the other half in South Central Kentucky. She earned her national board certification in 2004. And then after having her first child, she left teaching to be a stay-at-home mom. A few years later, Jennifer was hired by a local university to teach pre-service teachers. This work gave her a renewed passion for preparing and supporting educators. She has a website full of resources, www.cultofpedagogy.com, dedicated to creating a vibrant, encouraging, stimulating community for teachers where they can support each other toward excellence. She believes that if we can reach across the limits of geography and find each other, there's no limit to the amazing things that we can accomplish. So I think we're gonna talk quite a bit about some of those connections that Jennifer has made via her website and podcast and beyond. And I'm super excited to have her here. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Andrea. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, make sure if you guys have questions from our audience, tweet those to us at hashtag IAEdChat. Otherwise, we have some questions drawn up to ask Jennifer tonight as well. So I'll go ahead and get started. My first question for you is, tell us about yourself and your experience in the education landscape. Well, a, a lot of the introduction that you just read included what my teaching background was. It was some years in middle school, and then I worked with pre-service teachers for a while. And I just really, I loved working with pre-service teachers so much. Um, and I, I just had to get a couple of extra credits in order to keep my teaching certification. I decided to do those in ed tech, and they showed me how to make a blog in that, in those classes. And I thought, this is really great. I can keep working with pre-service teachers this way. Um, and so I just kind of kept doing it and kept growing it. And, and now this is my full-time job. I just, I just do everything I can to try to help teachers, um, uh, get better at what they're doing. And, and I've been doing it for almost five years now. Awesome. Thanks so much. I love in your Twitter bio, it's, uh, you help teachers crush it in the classroom and, uh, so many amazing resources. Uh, on cultofpedagogy.com that we will talk about a little bit later here this evening. But uh, people, we've got a great guest for uh, all of you tonight. So Jennifer, you do make a great deal of connections um, via your website and podcast, which is called The Cult of Pedagogy. How did you get started making these connections and how have you grown your platform? Well, it started with uh, friends and family. When I wrote my first blog post, I made a list of all the people that I knew who were teachers. And I basically sent them a link to it on Facebook and said, Hey, I'm starting a blog for teachers. Can you guys share it with people, you know, and, uh, it's, it's kind of neat because a lot of those people are still reading my stuff and sharing it now. And I, it's because of them that I got that started. Um, once I kind of got going, it really was just a matter of, I think, 
um, maybe building a presence on other places that were more established. I spent a lot of time over on Edutopia commenting on other people's posts. And, and then um, I had, you know, I, I realized that I could write guest posts on other websites. And so doing that helped to sort of bring people back to me. Um, and then it also really helped to to interview people for my website, people that were more well-established, people who were writing education books. That was mostly what it was. I would read books and then I would interview the authors either on my podcast or just, <clears throat> I would write about their books and say, hey, I wrote a review of your book. And then they'd say, what is this thing you're doing? And so it was sort of <clears throat> a lot of that at first, sort of reaching out to more well-established people and just um, trying to provide value myself to them in some way. And then just by doing that. And then, and really once I was doing that, then it was just a matter of continuing good and be consistent about that. Because, you know, if I was reaching out to somebody saying, Hey, you know, pay attention to me over here and I didn't have anything to offer, then that really wouldn't, wouldn't help much. So, um, it was just a really slow, steady, steady crawl <laughs> at first, but just, yeah, I wasn't in a hurry. Uh, um, so basically it. So that's great. And I, I love how you kind of talked about the process going through just getting started with family and friends and so forth. So talk to us, if you would, just a little bit of a follow-up. How often do you try to commit to post to get new content? You mentioned that people coming back yeah. and you have some hard and fast rules. I know some of our people that, uh, we interact with on Iowa ed chat, they're overwhelmed by blogging or whatnot. And I mm -hmm. share my story. I try to get one once per month, one one post per mm -hmm. month or whatnot to keep that content fresh or whatever. But what what do you have in mind or what guidelines do you work with, Jennifer? It's, it's, it's a really interesting question because I am just now this weekend experiencing a big shift in that. Um, <clears throat> I've been trying to do one per week for the last five years. Um, I think the first time that I didn't do that, it was devastating for me that I was like missing it. And I, I, I've got a post called Letter to an Overachiever that I end up writing after that because I realized like this is horrible and nothing bad happened <laughs> when I didn't do that. So um, <clears throat> I've taken a couple of breaks in that schedule just every once in a while, I'll skip a week or something, but I've just realized now I've got almost, they take me so much time. When I hear other bloggers say that they can write a blog post in half an hour, I, I fall over and beat the ground because some of my blog posts take me 20 hours to write. Um, because I'm pulling together resources and I'm linking out to research and I'm making graphics to go with them. And it's just, it's getting a bit ridiculous at this point. And I can't, I can't make myself stop. And so I've just actually just decided that I am going to start to cut down to probably every other week now, um, because I don't want to scrap on the quality, but the quality is going to eventually lead me to burnout completely. And so um, I'm going to probably do it to where it's more like twice a month now um, and and continue to put my old stuff out there in circulation and promote it on social media and let my email list know like, hey, this great post I wrote in 2016, go read it and um, sort of count on that because, you know, every now and then I'll get feedback from people. Somebody on Twitter will say, oh, I just found your website. And I'm like, and they're like, I can't, you know, I, it's like a maze. I can't like stop reading because there's so much stuff there. So I'm like, maybe it's okay for me to scale back a little bit now um, because there's a good catalog there. So um, yeah, I think once a month, especially for somebody who's, who's teaching full time is very reasonable. I, I think anything that you can keep up consistently is, is a smart move. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks for going there and kind of talking through your process for that. Um, because we we do have a number of people that that that's their question is uh, how do I get started and what's what's realistic for me to post. So thank you so much. Sure. Well, and I think going into the next question, it talks about how you have so many podcasts on your reel already. But I also think knowing how much content you have for your blogs, it's absolutely okay to recirculate that because it's going to be right there learning for somebody when they see it, whether they've been yeah. following you for five years or five minutes. So yeah. I think it's awesome to recirculate that. So as I said, your podcast reel is reaching over 90 episodes. Tell us about a few of your most impactful or insightful interviews from your podcast. Can you hear me now? 
Okay, I muted myself because I am constantly clearing my throat. I'm, I'm getting over a cough, so I didn't. You all do not know, need to hear me um, clear my throat. So, um, so three that I think are really significant. That still my favorite episode of all, and I'm up to I'm recording 92 tomorrow. Uh, my favorite episode still is episode four, which is an interview that I did with a friend of mine who has a daughter with autism. And uh, we, it just was, I just think it was such an important conversation because she basically like went there with me and on a lot of things and talked about what it's like to see her daughter get rejected by friends and some of the things that teachers would do that would really underestimate her abilities. And I just feel like it, it provided so many really deep insights on what it is like for a parent of a child with autism. And and how teachers, well-meaning teachers, some things like that. And she also talked about her own processes in terms of advocating for her daughter and like planning some stuff out to make things a little bit, you know, go better. And I just think it's just such a rich episode. So that's episode four. Um, 64, uh, four ways teachers can support students of color. This is an interview that I did with Dina Simmons, who has this fantastic TED talk about um, about growing up and being treated. She she grew up in the Bronx, and then she ended up going to this private elite private school, and just talked a lot about the way she was treated by teachers. Again, a lot of times, sometimes well-meaning teachers, and how it impacted her self identity. And it's just a it's just a really important episode, I think, because I think we still have so many teachers are, well, so many are white women. And then we have lots and lots of white men too. And our, our student population is so diverse. And I just feel like there are a lot of really important insights on, on little tiny shifts that we can make as teachers to, um, to support our students that are coming from different backgrounds. And um, it's not just a, an episode meant for white teachers. It's for all teachers, but it's sort of, I don't know, it's it's just really important. And then the other one is episode 84, which I did not too long ago, um, an interview with Pernille Rip. Um, and it was an interview I wanted to do for such a long time because she and I both believe that schools are just not handling reading instruction the way that they should be. And, and we're churning out a generation of kids that think reading is just passages and multiple choice questions, and they have not developed a love of books. And so Pernille and I just really dig, dig into that and talk about what the problem is and a different approach, a, an approach that uses Donna Lynn Miller's book Whisperer as sort of a basis and um, how to make kids lifelong readers who just, you know, devour books and really, and really love it. So that that episode has really resonated with a lot of people too. So um, those are three that I, if people have never heard my podcast before, I'd say they should start with those. Fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer, for those. We will definitely be checking those out. Again, people, episode four, 64 and 84 on the Cult of Pedagogy podcast. And of course, she's uh, got 91 episodes almost 92 recorded so definitely check out that podcast there's some great things happening there so it's obvious jennifer that connection to others and education is a passion of yours mm -hmm. talk to our viewers about why this is important in today's educational landscape man well you know when i was teaching full-time um i really it was very hard to find like-minded people in the building and if I had had something like <clears throat> like Twitter then uh, and could have run across some of the people that I know now who are enthusiastic and who are looking for ways to improve and who really value relationships with kids, um, I just think that could have made a huge difference in my outlook because I just kind of, I was somebody who just would shut my door and just do my thing and I... Would just so I think it is just so important to be able to find people who view this work we do in a similar way. Um, <clears throat> for me, since I've have been on social media as in this role, um, I've found two. It's sort of the two different directions that have really benefited me. Um, one, the more connections I have, you know, the more like Twitter followers I have, it, it ends up being such an important tool because I can get on Twitter now and I can throw out a question 
and I will get hundreds of responses back. I wrote a, a post a couple weeks ago about alternative methods for PD, for professional development. And um, that all came from me just asking Twitter, <laughs> what other things are you seeing out there besides traditional sit and get um, professional development? And I got, I think, close to 300 responses to that. And so after me, this is what I mean when I say it can take me 20 hours to do a blog post because it just, <clears throat> it took forever to comb through them and, and find them. But it was such an amazing resource. And, and one of the big privileges that I have now is that I get to like find people that are doing these great things and then just sort of flip them around and like say, hey world, look what they're doing. And that's the other direction. It's the incoming information that I can get from these connections. But then when I find somebody, I can then share it with the world. Um, I've got a, another post that I didn't mention in our notes to each other, but it's called The Compliments Project. It's a video that I got from a teacher of project is for watch the whole class activity. And when I found it, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to share this right away. I wrote a post about it. I shared the video. And and now we're getting we're getting tweets from teachers all over the world who are doing the same activity with their students. And these are the this is the kind of activity that will change the way a kid sees themselves, and it'll and they'll remember it just forever. I mean, it's it's like an anti bullying thing. It's just incredible. So, it, I mean, it gives me goosebumps to to know that I can actually do that. That somebody from somewhere in the world can just reach me in a matter of seconds, show me this thing, and then I can flip it around, and it just goes all over the place. It's just, I mean, it's almost scary because I realize it's it's a big responsibility. I have to be careful <laughs> what I'm sharing because I, I've got to vet it and make sure that, I don't know, it's not stealing somebody's idea or it's, you know, but still it's just, um, and I and I feel like we can all do that, you know, when I find a teacher who's, who's really needing something and they're feeling really lost, they're teaching kind of out in the middle of nowhere and they need help with something. And now I can even retweet their tweet and say, who can help this person and all these wonderful people just show up and say, I can, I can. And they don't get anything out of it except for just knowing that they're making some other teacher somewhere um, better and, and, and giving them support. So it's just, it just amazes me sometimes. It's probably a, a week does not go by without something really amazing happening, happening, especially on Twitter, I think. Um, and I can remember hearing people say before I got on that it was the best professional development they ever got. And I thought, yeah, I don't even get what you're talking about, but I, I did, but it really is. So I'm going to clear my throat again. <laughs> a second. Okay, I'm back. Hey, didn't even hear it. <laughs> All right. So um, thinking about the vast amount of information that you have available on your um, website, I mean, you're making connections all the time. And and going from when you first started, and there are teachers that think it's just them inside their four little walls trying to do it on their own. But I feel like you just open up so many of those um, classrooms and are able to share the stories of other educators. And I just think it's awesome. So um, definitely check out the podcast. There's a never ending supply of amazing stuff in her podcast. But I think now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of your um, blog posts because they're really, I mean, the way that you have your website organized is amazing. So you've got several popular blog posts also known as what's called the meat inside of the sandwich that is called to pedagogy. So these are divided into three main categories, instruction, assessment, and um, management, or uh, instruction, management, and technology. So then what I appreciate about trying to find things on your website is then you dig deeper. So then you can also go into some other hot topics. So hot topics in leadership, leadership, book reviews, professional development, and then learning theory, but that you can also dig deeper and support investment in learning about the teacher. So investing in your teacher soul, which is something that I don't think us educators do enough mm -hmm. because we are always so worried about those kids in our classroom but we also have to invest time in ourselves. So um, those focuses on attitude adjustments, working together, inspiration and stories. So if you can think about some of your um, 
either favorite favorite posts that you it was fun for you to craft or to share out or the responses that you've gotten from mm. people. But mm -hmm. just talk to us about some of your blog posts because I think there's a lot of meat and potatoes in there that are just excellent resources for teachers. So we talked about this ahead of time and I made some notes and I can see some of the ones that you all linked to. So I'm going to just quickly go through the ones that have been <clears throat> the most popular um, that have resonated the most. And so definitely the one that has reached the most teachers over time is Find Your Marigold, um, which was actually one of my earliest posts. And it really kind of sums up. It's what I used to tell my student teachers. I would, I would give them all kinds of tips about, you know, have a bell ringer and, you know, make sure you've got processes going in your class. But I used to say to them, all of this stuff doesn't matter <laughs> if you don't find people who are going to, who, who love teaching and who are going to like really support you in that. Um, <clears throat> and, and unfortunately it is because I was surrounded by uh, fairly negative people. A lot of those characters that I write about in that <clears throat> are based on the flavors of negativity. and. There is oddly a lot of pressure on teachers to adopt that negativity fairly early on. It's almost a mark of sophistication to be jaded and, and bitter. And I think this is for some reason particularly strong in middle schools. Um, it's unfortunate, but that just seems to be really common. And so <clears throat> I just took that message and I spent a lot of time trying to find a metaphor that would really stick. <laughs> and found this idea of uh, people, gardeners plant marigolds next to other plants to protect them from pests while they start to grow. And once they grow strong enough to handle life on their own, they don't need that marigold there, but the marigold, and I kind of don't like the fact that it's a flower because it sounds kind of corny. It's just like, you know, sunshine and roses, but it's like, they're actually protecting you from, from bad stuff. So <clears throat> that, has, that has been shared many, many, many times and it's definitely one of my most read posts. So if people have not read it yet, then Tonight would be a good night to read it. Um, and then another one is, uh, is on pineapple charts, which um, this came from a book that I wrote with uh, Mark Barnes a couple years ago called Hacking Education. And uh, it actually came from my sister, kind of came from my sister and I kind of worked on it together, but she, she used to hang a pineapple outside her door. She teaches science in Massachusetts. Um, and just, it was a way of saying to people, like throwing out the welcome mat and saying, come on into my room. You can come watch me, whatever, whenever you want. And, and she liked to have her peers observe her. And uh, I remember thinking it was a cool idea. And I asked her, you know, did they ever take you up on it? And she was like, eh, <laughs> not much, not really. And I thought, you know, I know if I worked in a school and I knew that there was one teacher down the hall who occasionally put a pineapple outside her door, I might not ever know. I wouldn't know what she was doing. I wouldn't want to like walk in and be like, oh, I'm not interested in this. So I thought, what if you advertise it in a central location, like what you were doing, like, Hey, we're dissecting frogs today. You want to come watch and be like, Oh yeah, that sounds really cool. So that's where the pineapple chart was sort of born. And, and we actually had her school sort of pilot it and try it so that it was actually something that was happening in a school. And it's just a calendar, you know, first period, second period, third period, Monday through Friday. And teachers are encouraged to just advertise what they're doing and, and say, this would be a good day for people to come. We're trying this tech tool or we're practicing, we're doing reader's theater today, or we're learning about, you know, the Spanish Inquisition or something like that. And I mean, I know, especially a lot of us say we wish we could go back to history class again and learn it because we didn't pay attention. So it's, it could be a variety of reasons that people would go and visit their peers. Um, you know, and the idea is that we, we could learn so much from each other if we just sat in on each other's classrooms every once in a while, and you can learn a million different things. You can see a sign up in somebody's room and go, oh, I didn't know you could organize things that way. I'm gonna try that in my room. Um, and I also just think there's something really amazing about watching other people do the thing that they're trained to do. And we hardly ever get to see each other do that. You know, we all go off into our little pods and do it. And like, you, you don't even realize sometimes how amazing your peers are until you see it. Um, and so, and the idea is that that is really something that I really encourage administrators to do is to not mess this up by formalizing it too much. And please don't force people to like write objectives and write, you know, reflection notes later and turn it into a requirement because then everybody's going to hate it. So it, the idea is that it's very informal. And I've heard from schools where it's gone well, and I've heard from schools where they're like, yeah, nobody's really taking this up on it. So 
I'm encouraging them to try to like bribe people, like give them a good parking spot for a month if they'll be the first person to like put their name up there, or whatever. Um, so <clears throat> the pineapple chart did really well too. Um, and some of my favorites, one is called, um, it's a it's a letter that I wrote to school administrators, uh, and it's probably six months ago. Uh, partly because I, you know, I, I feel like teachers can't tell their administrators how they really feel about the things that they really need. Uh, they don't want to sour the relationship. They don't. I don't know. It's hard to tell your boss things that they're not doing well, and I hear the same things over and over again. So that letter was basically. I started off by telling them how. I get that they're in a hard position because I don't think anybody understands how hard an administrator's job is. But then there were just some things that I said, if you would start to do these things and stop doing these things, you, you would have a really good response from your staff. Um, and so like one of the things was about how I wish administrators would please go directly to the person who has done the wrong thing instead of telling the whole staff Oh, please stop doing this because then you got all of your teachers who never did anything wrong sitting there thinking, oh my God, what did I do? I didn't, I didn't, I, I about me it freaks everybody out. So, and I, th I think that administrators do that because they kind of want to avoid conflict uh, and it creates a lot more problems. Uh, and another thing I asked them to do is to just please start fighting harder for your teachers when it comes to policies and stuff that comes from above. I think they're in a, in a tough spot because they get directive from above and they just seem along with it. Maybe don't. But um, I think teachers don't feel like they're being fought for very much. So that was it. another one was five teaching practices I'm kicking to the curb. That one resonated really well with a lot of people because um, it knocked down things like punishing, taking away recess from everybody and popcorn reading and a couple of things that lots of teachers do. And there's a lot of research that's saying, please don't do this. It's really damaging. It's not, it's not an educationally sound thing to do. Um, and then one more is just how to stop yelling at your students, which I was, I was occasionally a yeller and I know lots of other people can be yellers sometimes. And so I just sort of pulled together some, some thoughts on how you can, how you can stop doing that. Cause it, it just it doesn't feel good to lose control and it can become a habit and so so those are those are some of the blog posts that that i think are uh i guess important and and you have such a variety of topics like it's i can't imagine trying to pick the ones that are the most important to you but i know you know just briefly looking through the website for some of the ones that I've read years ago and then like, oh my gosh, I forgot about that one. And then <laughs> um, it's, 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 it was really hard for me because I went through this week and started kind of posting some of the ones that I was like, oh, I got to remember to go back and read this one again. <laughs> and there are so many that what I appreciate the most is it's not like it takes forever to read these blog posts. It's, oh, it's good. something that you could do if you have 10, 15 minutes of spare time, set aside some time to read some of these resources off your blog posts and you definitely are professionally developing in five or 10 minutes just by, oh, you know, connecting great. to some of the resources on your website. And, you know, some of the people that I are in my job with me will laugh a little bit about this, that I'm kind of a grammar queen. And I know your post about, can we please stop with the two period or two spaces after the period? It's like, yeah, that was simple. And I constantly am trying to catch myself do that because I want to be up with What's relevant now? So I appreciate that post a that lot as well. So that's kind of so much trouble. <laughs> I I got hate mail for that post. I mean, oh, yeah, I don't even retweet that one because I'm like, no, I don't want to deal anymore. I don't deal with the arguments anymore. <laughs> well, it was fantastic for me. I appreciated that post. <laughs> mm. All right, so we've got a couple <laughs> questions that have uh, come in from Twitter, Good. and uh, the first one is from Gretchen, and Gretchen says, I have a 1500 book challenge going on right now in my classroom. It's a play off of, uh, I'm thinking Donalyn Miller's book challenge. Um, mm -hmm. How do you suggest I keep circulating books in and out of my classroom library? Hmm. How to keep circulating? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm wondering if she's talking about in terms of like getting them back from students or if she's talking about keeping her inventory fresh. 
So I'll answer both. Um, I know that, and this was part of my interview with Pernille. Pernille made her system really, really simple. Uh, and I, so I would really suggest that she listen to that episode because she talks about kids checking books out. Um, <clears throat> and, and basically she's almost gotten to the point where she's just like, you know what, I'm going to lose the books every year. And she's just kind of accepted that. And that if that means a great book is home with a kid and they loved it, then that's great. If it got lost and, and made it into somebody else's hands, that's fine. More books for the world. And she just works really hard to raise the money to replace those. Um, and she also talks about getting the fresh books in. She, she'll actually, I would really work with your librarian on this. Um, she'll actually check books out of the library and maybe 10 at a time and display them in her classroom library. Um, and so that's another way to generate more interest. Sometimes just having the book pulled off the shelf and turned out outwardly, it can get more kids um, interested in it. So I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure if the question was that first one or the other, but if she hasn't listened to that episode, and I would definitely go to Pernille Rip and ask her to, uh, because she, she deals with it pretty much every problem that people might have with these types of things. And I bet she's got a better answer than I would have. <clears throat> That's great. Thanks. Um, and then one more, and we've hit on a couple of these topics and I think a couple of your answers that you would, you would say, this comes from uh, Jane Mathis and she says, any suggestions on how to help foster a culture centered on positive student relationships? Well, Wow, a culture center on positive. So yeah, and I've heard this from teachers before too that they they notice kids not treating each other all that well. Um, you know, I would have conversations about classroom norms. Um, I'm a big fan of Michael Linson's Smart Classroom Management, and uh, he that's just his blog, um, and he also has has some books too. But one of the things that I think is uh, really good about his approach to classroom management in general is about being really explicit with kids about what it looks like when you are behaving and what it looks like when you're not. And he will give almost role plays and examples of, of what these different things look like. And so I would think that that could also transfer into each other with respect. You may want to have set aside 15 minutes one day and say, you know, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of some conversations that I hear. And and you can even get a student and have them play off of you or whatever. And and show the kids what they sound like when they talk to each other and ask them, you know, is this is this a respectful way of hearing? Sometimes calling that stuff out without necessarily pointing a finger at those individual kids, it, it makes them hear themselves. Um, and then I would also say, give them opportunities to talk to each other. I'm a big fan of doing um, doing classroom icebreakers. I've got another blog post called Icebreakers at Rock, and it's about um, some of the icebreakers we do in our classrooms are ask to kids to take too many personal risks, you know? Um, and so these are like really silly, but the, it'll have kids get together with all of the other kids who have like the same favorite cookie as them. It gets them to talk about these really like simple topics, but they find things that they have in common that they never would have thought of because these aren't kids that they hang out with or they'll line up in order of their birthday or something like that. So where nobody's having to admit to anything weird about themselves. These are all basic things, but then they just, they laugh and they talk about stuff. You know, do you prefer cats or dogs? And um, <clears throat> it just gives them an opportunity to talk. We're so concerned sometimes with getting kids to shut up and sit down and get to work. And they really do need to socialize. And so letting them do that in a supervised situation, um, you know, it just, it gives them opportunity. So, you know, a lot of times when we have things like maker challenges in our classroom or STEM challenges, those are opportunities for kids to problem solve and socialize together. So um, I think it's a lot of things. I think it's the way that the teacher relates to the kids too, but those are just a couple of ideas anyway. That's great. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer. So we'll get back to the script and uh, the, some of the questions that we've got prepared for you. And you have a few uh, major projects that are technology related. So tell us about Teacher's Guide to Tech and your online tech course, Jumpstart. And I was just, I asked them, what are some of the major problems that you're facing, that you're dealing with? How can I, how can I help you? And there were obviously a variety of things, but one thing that did keep coming up 
that I thought was interesting was technology. And it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. A lot of teachers said, I want to use more technology. I know that I should, but I am just so overwhelmed by all the choices. I just can't keep track of, of all the stuff that's out there. I have no time to research it. I can't figure out what the best tools are to use. And I thought, well, why don't I write a blog post? <laughs> and I was going to write a blog post of all the different tools. And I would kind of like chunk them into categories. I'd put all the social media tools together. I'd put all the um, you know, video creation tools together. And that blog post eventually turned into like a 200 page PDF because I started to realize like it would be better if I could link them to a video that shows the tool in action and maybe give them a list of like some ideas for how this tool could work in your classroom and what kinds of things you could do with your students with it. So now it's the teacher's guide to tech. It's a, it's a PDF. E uh, that's a tool. So all the tools are grouped together and um, podcasting tools are grouped together and feedback tools and collaboration tools. And so it'll, my, my thinking is, and what I'm trying to do for teachers is save them all the time that it would take for them to start, you know, digging around and figuring things out. Um, I sort of list like what it costs. Is it free? Is it, can you can use it on a Mac. Can you use it on, you know, windows or whatever? Is it only web-based? Um, and also, I personally, the, one of the reasons that I wrote it in the first place was because this is back when I was kind of first starting, I would tell people that I had a podcast and I would see their eyes glaze over. They'd get that look like, okay, I know I've heard of what a podcast is, but I'm not exactly sure. And I'm not going to look stupid by asking. And I realized that a lot of people just don't want to look dumb. They'll hear somebody say, oh yeah, I just started using, you know, Voxer. And they're like, okay, well, I don't know what that is. So I'm just not going to ask because a lot of people just don't want to ask. And so I thought if they could come to this thing and they could just go to the index and find the word Voxer and click on it and it would hyperlink them straight to the tool and it would explain it to them, then they would be able to find out really quickly and I would explain it in plain language. And and so I'm just really proud of it because it's become a major, major project, but I think it really helps teachers. It's just an encyclopedia, basically. It's a quick clickable encyclopedia of technology. Um, but then about a year or two after I started doing that, I realized they might, that teachers might need more than that. They might need more than just this guide because they, they might have this stuff but not know exactly like, okay, well, how, where do I even start with all of these things? Now I know what they all are, but I don't even know how to start. So that was when I created my online course called Jumpstart. Um, and realizing that tools change all the time and that there's new stuff that comes out all the time, what I decided to do was build that around processes <clears throat> on, and I chose 10 of what I thought were the most important processes, tech related processes that teachers should know and be able to choose their own tools for them. <clears throat> and so for example, the first module of the course in this course, which are teachers, they set up their own blog. I teach them the basics of how to do it. And then that's how they turn their assignments in for the rest of the course. They're all blog posts after that. But because I think once a person understands how the back end of a blog works, they already start understanding a lot of stuff about technology, just get understanding that whole concept. Um, and then there's other modules. There's like how to create an online assessment and um, how to create a screencast video recording. I think once a teacher understands how to make a screencast recording, the whole world opens up. That was actually one of my very first tech tools outside of Microsoft Word and PowerPoint was understanding how to make a screencast video. And it was like, I could do this for everything. I could have a whole library of stuff. So um, it's a hands-on course. Uh, teachers do 10 projects. They, you know, they make a project with QR codes and they make a little quick podcast recording. And, um, and then with every module, they're asked to sort of reflect on how can you actually take this into your classroom and, and how would this work with your students and to, to think through that. So, um, that's a that's a great course. It's an just can work through themselves any time of the year, but then we also open it up five times a year where they actually get support. And that's Jumpstart Plus. It's another level of it where they actually have um, like mentors that can help them. We have a private um, online community. They can go in and ask questions. They share the links to their projects, and um, you know you're on a deadline calendar then. So teachers that take that level of it tend to finish because they have a schedule that they're trying to follow. So um, People can find out about either one of those at just going to teachersguidetech.com. There's information about the guide and about the course there. I also shared on our um, 
hashtag but links to both of those so if you guys are have you know an interest for to look into that deeper make sure you find those links down there we have another question alexandra says how can teachers become better counselors in the middle school in the middle school setting mm, gosh that's a really good question well I think uh, I think part of it is just understanding how to listen and validate. Um, that's another post I have. It's on. It's called the magic of validation, and I, I feel like this just understanding this is huge for uh, making kids feel like they're heard. Um, a lot of times we just, just want to dismiss if, if a kid expresses some sort of a problem. We want to just say, "Oh, you know, you're fine. Go back and sit down," or you just want to get out of work or whatever. And if if we can just learn how to just reflect back to them what they're saying, <laughs> you know, I, I hear you know, it sounds like you're really frustrated right now. Um, it, we can actually help them solve more of their problems. I mean, and obviously our kids are coming to us with some serious, serious issues that a lot of teachers are not equipped to, to manage. And, and, you know, then we need to be referring kids to guidance and to professionals. But I think a lot of times they come to us with problems that we don't even realize because we are so interested, you know, busy about getting back to your seat and get back to work and stop trying to derail things. <clears throat> and if we could become better reflective listeners uh, and better at just validating. And, and I just, in the post, I actually talk about how validating isn't the same as agreeing with what they're saying. And so I think there's a lot of fear of, you know, if somebody's complaining about something and you give them a chance to complain, then you're, then you're feeding into it. Um, but I, I've actually found that when you validate a person's concerns, you actually end the conversation quicker because that person is no longer trying to fight to be heard. So that would be that would be one tip for sure. Would be just to learn a little bit more about what validation looks and sounds like. Great, great. Um, I shared the link to that one as well, but I mean, even just thinking about if they just need a platform to be heard, it's not like they want you to solve their problems, they just wanna be heard. So mm -hmm. that's a great, great thing to think about. Um, you, you share so much with so many people in a variety of formats. Where do you get your inspiration? Um, it comes from a lot of places. Uh, a lot of it comes from my own kids and friends of mine who have kids in school and we just hear are going on in school. Um, some of my best posts have come from assignments that have come home from my kids. And I thought, oh, we don't need to be doing that. And it's a hard line to draw because I don't want my kids' teachers to feel like I'm just watching them and waiting for material. Um, because a lot of times I understand why teachers do the things they do. I mean, it, it, a lot of it makes sense, but I want to get the message out there that this thing here, if you could tweak it a little bit, it'd be a lot more effective. Um, a lot of ideas now come from teachers that I'm connected to through social media. Um, I belong to some groups that I just listen in on and I hear some of the things they talk about. And also people just write me emails and they say, what about this? And they like the questions that we've gotten tonight. Um, those things turn into blog posts a lot of times. Um, and I do pick up some things just from paying attention to the news and current events. Uh, sometimes I try to stay away from that because anytime I, put something out there that is a little bit political in nature or controversial, I have to basically prepare myself to answer a hundred emails, respond to a lot of tweets about it and, and stuff. But there are things that are worth, you know, fighting that stuff over. But, um, you know, I'm, I've, I've had, I've wanted to write for a while on the topic of school choice and, and how that's impacting things. And yeah, it just requires a lot of research, but, um, but a lot of it just comes from conversations that I have. I'd say my first year of blogging, it all just came from my own experience. It just came from my own teaching. It was a lot of catharsis. I <laughs> mean, just wanted to get stuff out that I had experienced. But um, now a lot of it is just coming from, from talking to people who read my stuff. Fantastic. Fantastic, Jennifer. We're getting close to the end, and uh, we've got a couple more questions for you. But the next one that I've got, if you could change one thing in the landscape of education, what would that be? Well, I actually uh, alluded to this a little bit earlier, but I think I, I really would love to see this sort of 
principal level and superintendent level of administration start pushing back um, on the testing culture. Um, I think a lot of people blame Common Core for the tests that we got. And I don't, I think it's the implementation and the testing related to Common Core that created such a problem and the hysteria about testing our kids as much as we do. And not only that, but the test prep. And I think that's really the thing that's driving everybody crazy right now. I just got done talking to my sister uh, yesterday about the stress that her kindergarten son is feeling because he's not allowed to go out to recess until he finishes his work and his work is test prep stuff. <laughs> and that makes me want to tear my fingernails out one by one. He's five. And the reason that he is being put in this position and having anxiety about school at age five is because his teacher is forcing a lot of test prep on him and her administrator may be forcing a lot of test prep on her and her admin a lot of test prep on the school and they may be getting it from the state. I don't know exactly what all the different levels are, but I feel like somebody besides the teachers needs to be starting to push back up at least. Um, I really admire an administrator that says, you know what, <laughs> we're not going to feed into that crap. We are just going to continue teaching our kids really well and making this a place of joy and making it a place of discovery and continuing to give them music and art and play time and build relationships. And we may do a little bit of test prep here and there, but I'm not, I, I are doing that. And I, I would love to see more, uh, more leaders, I guess, whoever it is that makes these decisions, um, decide to get things back into balance because I think it's it's the it's the test prep and it's the over documentation that is making it's pushing teachers out. I don't think it's the salaries. When I hear teachers who leave, they they hardly ever say I couldn't you know I couldn't make ends meet. They are just they're miserable with the amount of paperwork and documenting and test prep and and constant assessing and constant data analysis and it's all to to feed this test um so that if, if i if we could change one thing it would be that we know so much about what helps kids learn and 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 still teachers are still having to do things that are not that so that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, teachers don't get into education for the money. So you've got that right. It's not right. because of yeah. their salaries that they're not staying in the profession. So you're right about that. So Jennifer, the last question I have for you is, what's in store for you as you continue to move forward? Well, um, by scaling back a little bit on the blog post, it is to make room for some other projects. I've been wanting to write a book forever. Um, pull some of my blog posts into something more cohesive and thread them together with uh, some connective tissue and make it like one thing. So I, I want to work on a book, but that's actually next year. This coming year, um, I actually am planning on doing two more online courses. Um, one that's just on leveling up your instruction with some some really good sort of tweaks that teachers can make to to get better at actually teaching stuff. And then another one that's just going to be on assessment. It's just going to be on formative assessment, designing a really good quality summative assessment uh, on rubric development and just really digging into that stuff. I feel like I've got a lot of good stuff on my site and it's all like, it's all over the place. So I want to pull that together. I want to go into more detail. I want to get more videos and, um, and just really have, I don't have anything on my site right now that, that people can go straight to and learn all the stuff that they would need if that's the kind of thing that they're looking for. I feel like I've done that with the tech guide for tech stuff, but now I've got all this relationship stuff that I want to pull into a book. And then I've got all the instructional stuff that I want to pull into a couple of courses to really like dig into the techniques. So that's what I'm freezing up. Awesome. Can't hear you. I think okay, I caught the last part of that. Um, so what I'm hearing is stay tuned. And there are a mm -hmm. lot of really good things mm -hmm. coming for Cult yeah. of Pedagogy. So very exciting stuff. You guys, make sure if you haven't already, I, we've shared a bunch of leaks, links on the Twitter feed. But go ahead and just go to www.cultofpedagogy.com. And there are links to 
everything that we've talked about tonight and so much more, you can find um, all of her links to her podcasts, links to the blog posts, and so much more. And you will have no problem finding something that you can try tomorrow. So um, if you want to find her, follow her on Twitter at Cult of Pedagogy. And I'm sure she would love it if you start listening to her podcast for um, give her a like and give her a comment, subscribe. <laughs> so uh, all those things that podcasters would love you to do. So <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to you for a quick closing, Jennifer, just to give us a final thought or a comment for our Iowa Edge Chat Live viewers. I would like to thank your viewers uh, for, I mean, I, I hate to do this because I know our, I've, I've had principals that would say, you know, thank you so much for the work you do. But just, man, I just, I know how exhausting this work is that you're doing. And it is just, I don't even want to say hang in there, but just recognize how special your work is. I mean, you have these connections with people that it's set up in a way for you to connect to them in a way that, that most people just don't have that. And, and just start looking at for looking at it hour by hour and what, what can you do in this one hour to just make some kind of a difference to some kid and, um, and, and really just do things that help you to sustain yourself. And I, and I do feel like that is all in connecting with other people that have that same passion as you and whatever it takes, whether it's going out and gossiping, going to happy hour, whatever it is to take to blow off steam, but just to remind yourselves of what awesome people you are and what important, important work you're doing. That is my final message. <laughs> That's a mic drop. That's a mic drop. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to wrap up here with some upcoming Iowa regional and national events. We've got a big list, ladies and gentlemen. So first off, in about two weeks, the Iowa 1-to-1 one -one Conference, which is April 3rd and 4th at the Iowa Event Center in Des Moines. You'll want to check that out. Also in April, the Iowa ASCD Curriculum Academy coming up on the 19th and 20th of April. That's in Ankeny. And special guest, uh, former Iowa Ed Chat live guest, Peter DeWitt, as well as stories from various schools in Iowa. What great educators do differently. All kinds of conferences coming up there. And they have four locations here in the next couple months. Nashville, Tennessee, April 13th and 14th. Houston, Texas on the 17th of April, San Diego, California on May 11th, and then in Virginia on August 3rd. Keystone's premier education conference, Breaking Barriers, Challenging the Boundaries of Learning at the Grand River Center in Dubuque. That is June 18th and 19th. And then also save the date for Benton Community Ed Camp focused on teacher leadership at Benton Community Schools, June 21st. And then again, Dr. Ryan Wise, our director of education in the state of Iowa will be there as a special guest. And then another What Great Educators Do Differently uh, conference coming to West Des Moines, Iowa, September 14th. That will feature Jimmy Casas, Jeff Zoll, and Todd Whitaker. That one is dedicated to leadership. So What Great Educators Do Differently coming to our backyard in West Des Moines. If you've got regional, local, national events you'd like to highlight on our shows, send us a link and we will give it a shout out. So I'm going to wrap this baby up. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your thoughts on Iowa Ed Chat Live. We are always live the last Sunday of every month, and it's always great learning with all of you. I want to provide a very special thank you to our guest tonight, Jennifer Gonzalez. Thank you so much. You rocked. So many great resources shared, ideas, thoughts. We appreciate you. And to our followers, be sure to follow some of your new friends that you met on the hashtag this evening and continue that conversation. You can find a great deal of resources on our website, which is tinyurl.com backslash IAEdChat. We will be off next week in observance of the Easter holiday, but we will be back with another great topic and some exciting news on Sunday, April 8th. Until next time, be the change. Good night, everyone.